From a variety of locations in Winnipeg, Manitoba, you are hearing Painting the Invisible, a program about the present or present. Either way, you'll see. Today's recontextualization focuses on A Mechanical Bride by Marshall McLuhan. Thank you for tuning in. Just going to jump right in and explain to you the format as it unfolds for me, for you. Essentially, this is going to be a collage of conversation. It's, at this point, just between myself. I am editing it in order for it to become things that have been inspired by the preface of the McLuhan book, The Mechanical Bride, Folklore of Industrial Man. It came out in 1951, and it got reprinted in 1967, which is the version that I have by Beacon Press. It was originally published by Vanguard. I'll get into the specifics of, of the creation of it, when, who, which, all that kind of stuff. I will do that um, before this is finished, but this is the first podcast episode of Painting the Invisible what I mean by painting the invisible. I hope that you enjoy this non-linear process. And by non-linear, I mean non-linear. Like, literally, I've changed the focus of the episode already. The change in focus has been, rather than focus on the mechanical bride, we're going to focus on Take Today, The Executive as Dropout, by Marshall McLuhan and Barrington Nevitt. This uh, book came out in 1972, but I'll confirm that once I pick it up off the floor and uh, get to it. So why don't we do that? It came out in 1972, copyright 1972 by McLuhan Associates. Marshall was getting, uh, what's it called? Independent at this point, I guess, because people probably weren't really feeling it. Feeling it, feeling it, feeling it. Page 102 of Take Today, The Executive as Dropout, in the chapter, The Etherealization of Hardware by Software, Hardware and Software, in quotes. Discoveries from the resonant interval of quantum mechanics rather than the visual connection of rational systems. Many people of professional demeanor shun the punman, having been warned that verbal play is the lowest form of wit. These people have to bite their lips a good deal in order to repress their enjoyment of the most natural feature of all language, namely its inexhaustible riches or richness of incompatible meanings. I'll read that again. These people have to bite their lips a good deal in order to repress their enjoyment of the most natural feature of all language, namely its inexhaustible richness of incompatible meanings. Amazing. Incompatible meanings, juxtaposition, collage, the very information overload that we find ourselves in can probably be navigated a little more gracefully if we encourage the concept of allowing people to think, um, to, to encourage the concept for them to acknowledge when they notice puns, repurposes. I always think of uh, Survey to Heaven where, where we're plant things, you know sometimes words have new meaning. Whatever the intention of that phrase was, also is being repurposed repurposing recycling whatever you want to call it i'd rather call it repurposing because i don't want to sound like a hippie you say recycling automatically you're going to get um slotted but if you call it repurposing well it just sounds like commerce could still not cringe anyways let's move on James Joyce knew that any word was a storehouse of innumerable human perceptions that could be released by abrasive interplay with other words. Given any two words, he could invent a verbal universe. The following fugue, or dance of tones and gestures, if read aloud, provides a dramatic account of organized ignorance. Past, present, future of in the past, present, future of in the past, present, future of in the past, present, future of invention. In the ignorance that implies impression, that knits knowledge, that finds the name form, that wets the wits, that convey contacts, that sweetens sensation, that drives desire, that adheres to attachment, that dogs death, that bitches birth, that entails the ensuance of existentiality. Finnegan's Wake. 
Starting with the gap of ignorance that generates many layered perception, Joyce moves to the interweaving of new patterns of knowledge. The name form must be the exact word or formula for a specific effect, for a specific effect. A major means of tuning in. His repeated use of that is dem demonstrative stress, not mere linking. The exact name wets or sharpens the wits or senses and sets up new contacts or echoing intervals that enrich sensation. What I think that means is like when you hear a word and the word sounds like another word and you associate the intention with the other word without actually yourself knowing what the intention was until perhaps you see it in print and then realize you've been hearing it wrong the whole time. You can think of like the song Louie Louie, but there's a part on the medium is the massage LP, which I made a, a clip for because I put on a show where I had my band that I play drums in, The Breath Grenades, and another band I play drums in, Untilted. We, uh, it was an excuse to have a show, and the opening act was just simply called McLuhan Video, and it took place on August 22nd, uh, 2011, which I believe is one century, one month, and one day after McLuhan's um, birth. So... On that album, there was a phrase where someone says in, an, in another kind of tone, not McLuhan does a lot of spoken speaking on there, but then other people kind of, uh, other actors kind of like say aloud parts of the books. And someone that sounds like Daffy Duck said, We don't know who discovered water, but we're pretty sure it wasn't the fish. We don't know who discovered water, but we're pretty sure it's not it wasn't the fish i always thought that it was saying we don't know who discovered batter but we're pretty sure it wasn't the fish so confusing batter for or water for batter i was thinking yeah obviously a fish is not going to want to think of a way to eat itself uh, it didn't get further than that but it was always just an abstract bizarre idea that i thought i understood but equally <laughs> has meaning even in the misunderstanding and you know if you look at the etymology of all these words the hints of clarity are constantly in them anyway so yeah where were we <clears throat> the exact name wets or sharpens the wits or senses and sets up new contacts or echoing intervals that enrich sensation the exact name wets or sharpens the wits or senses and sets of new contacts or echoing intervals that enrich sensation. The inventor is the man abounding in sensational vigor and fresh energies derived from sharp contacts. He is ruthless in his quest and his pertinacity as he reaches for his natural prey. He is like the unleashed retriever pursuing to the death or the bitch in heat who will replace the lost generation and ensure the continuity of the living and the existent. Joyce here encapsulates, encapsulates the mental and physical drama of social man beleaguered by innumerable problems. All solutions are in the very words by which people confuse and hide their problems until the punman releases the secret of the magical word. The service itself reverberates with the labels that will ensue. In the same way, the more pains taken to protect a process or product, the more clues and opportunities are provided for those who wish to appropriate or to emulate the same. Patent system as chastity belt. Admittedly, some form of protection against technological competition is provided by the patent system, but it is often more nominal than real. The development of synthetic leather provides a recent example. DuPont spent 10 million pounds over 15 years to develop CoreFam and at the same time built a sizable patent barrier around it. However, when the Chloride Electrical Storage Company came up against these patents, far from being a hindrance, they provided the stimulus and the guidance necessary for producing an allegedly superior product. J.S. Metcalf, Metals and Materials, February 1970. 
Big business uses market responses as guides to the selection of new products and services. The fact that the market is a corporate donkey, which is never given a nibble at more than one out of every 200 new carrots, is only a meager index to the waste and ignorance exercised by bureaucratic idea sifters. <laughs> the rape of the lock is mandatory and inevitable. Anybody who provides a public for a new service has robbed himself since all publics are all publics are in the public domain. All publics are in the public domain. As soon as a taste for Coca-Cola is created, a rival is provided as part of the process. Hitherto, products have been studied at the expense of publics. Thus, there are endless histories of literature, but little, little study of reading publics. Uh. Endless studies, endless histories of literature, like Norton anthologies, but little study of the reading public. A public is structured by conflicting layers of taste and satisfaction which swiftly erode each other. At any time, a totally new public may develop any old public. The new TV public may go around the old movie or radio public, creating unexpected new products and satisfactions. The same happens with every form of transportation, each one engendering diverse satisfactions and needs that modify all earlier ones. Today, the business of business is becoming the constant invention of new business. When he says the term envelop old public, that new TV may new TV public may go around the old movie or radio public, creating unexpected new products and satisfactions. Obviously, in my opinion, that's like whenever there's a new technology that absorbs the habits of the old technology, which obviously we've reached a benchmark with initially um, the PC and you know the Mac and then the MacBook and then the first smartphone which I guess would be as far as like a benchmark again the iPhone and then now the iPad so the identity crisis between the iPad and the PC and the identity crisis between static access to the internet and mobile phone or just mobile computing smartphone access to the internet I wouldn't call like that the tactile habits of going home and going on your PC and working and then the freedom allowed by having a MacBook and then the you know like the additional freedom of having let's say access um, on your phone to the internet mobile these are refinements of existing habits that shave seconds off their execution. I mean, I don't have to lift up the, I don't have to un lift up the monitor part of the MacBook if I have an iPad. But I can't carry around an iPad as easily as I can carry around a phone. So in the future, it'll be like between the iPad and the phone as to which one is the one that kind of gets the kernel of whatever it is you're going to do next first and the inertia created from that kernel and then the approach towards whatever it is you're going to do is going to influence the end result of whatever it is you're going to do it, but it's so imperceptible that only by painting the invisible with data are we actually going to be able to sort of see what the habit is? Because at this point, it is yeah imperceptible. The change happens so quickly that you don't know, really, what the difference is. All we know is that we're constantly striking the iron. And as technologies become more and more tactile toward our existing habits, the only major difference is that everything's networked. So... It's inevitable that like job creation and microemployment will just, I believe, occur in the same way that Pinterest is driving revenue more so than Twitter because obviously Twitter still involves you having to choose words. Pinterest, you're just basically taking pictures that you find interesting and then Pinterest is including the URL. So any description you use 
that uh, derives or drives any sale. This is where, this is where the economy can, North America, specifically the U.S., and fuck the rest of the fucking world too. I mean, this is where the opportunity really is. This is where the opportunity really is. It's inevitable that like job creation and microemployment will just, I believe, occur in the same way that Pinterest is driving revenue more so than Twitter because obviously Twitter still involves you having to choose words. Pinterest, you're just basically taking pictures that you find interesting and then Pinterest is including the URL. So any description you use that uh, derives or drives any sale, this is where the opportunity really is. The problem, and I just watched this Bill Moyers, Moyers special, is that crony capitalism. The crony capitalism idea, I don't necessarily think it's wrong. However, the problem is that the sustainability of the ground that those figures, crony capitalism. the crony capitalists and their ilk, stand upon. The middle class, the lower class, the working class. While bailed out banks speculate with taxpayer money. We pay with the loss of jobs because of trade deals bought and paid for by multinational companies. We pay in tax rates higher than those of the billionaires who fund the super PACs. And we pay in the loss of political equality because one person, one vote means very little when those we elect do the bidding of donors instead of voters. I mean, they, it's kind of like, you know, you have people who are your managers. If you're a worker and you have your job and you keep your job and let's say whatever, it's, it's, it's you, you get what you're supposed to do. They get what they're supposed to do. Hicks, how come you're not working? I go, there's nothing to do. He go, well, you pretend like you're working, son. And I go, why don't you pretend I'm working? <laughs> you get paid more than me, you fantasize. <laughs> shit, pretend I'm mopping. I'll pretend they're buying shit, we can close up. Hey, I'm the boss, now you're fired. How's that for a fantasy, sir? And then sometimes they get pressure to achieve certain bottom lines and it's just like the diff knowing how to do your job knowing when to like hold back it's like it's like sex you gotta know you know when and what and how at the time that you're doing it it's constant balance and it's never there's never a conclusion for anybody and the end that's what you have to really know. I mean, for guys, of course we're gonna come. And I'm sure it's not that much difficult for women, but you have to have the right goal. The goal is that it's gotta be time not wasted, mentally and physically. So, how does that apply to crony capitalism and the economy? The moral issue of maintaining a false sense is... Because what it means is that a massive amount of resources are being devoted, uh, uh, being allocated or being channeled into pure financial speculation that has no gain uh, to society as a whole, has no real economic contribution to the process by which GNP is created, GDP is created, and growth occurs. One of the six AAA companies left in the United States, a massive half trillion dollar company, massive market capitalization, I'm talking about the eve of the crisis now in September 2008, suddenly when the commercial paper market starts to uh, uh, destabilize and short term rates went up, he calls up the Treasury Secretary with an SOS, I'm in trouble here, I need a lifeline. He had recklessly funded a lot of assets at General Electric Capital in the overnight commercial paper market and suddenly um, needed a bailout from the Treasury. Within days, that bailout was granted and therefore General Electric was able to avoid the consequence of its foolish lend long and borrow short policy. 
What they should have been required to do when the commercial paper market dried up, that was the excuse, they should have been required to offer uh, uh, equity, sell stock at a highly discounted rate, dilute their shareholders, and raise the cash they needed to pay off their commercial uh, paper. That would have been the capitalist way. That would have been the free market uh, way of doing things. And in the future, they would have been less likely to go back into this speculative mode of borrowing short and lending long. But when we get to the point... Like the drunk guy bragging. You know, or like the guy that got with the girl who was drunk bragging about it it's like that's you're you're not actually you didn't achieve what you're saying you did and by making a bad investment and then having to be bailed out it's just it can't go on and this well so there has to be a a, a meeting I think there has to be a movie. Someone's got to show the emotional resonance of how there has to be a shift in the mentality of investment and a shift in how investors of banks and, and have to have their, their expectations have to be broadened in a more realistic sense because clearly uh, this is not working. Yeah, it's, it's not... You can adapt, and of course, yeah, of course you can adapt. But why, you know, like, that's only part of the solution. You know, you can have people who I respect, you know, yeah, Adam Carolla, right? Like, you know, complaining, people that complain about taxes and this and that. But it's just like, I just would like to know if they th what his thoughts are on banks that get bailed out and then don't want to lend to the very public that kind of helped bail them out. You know, I, I don't think it's like, I, I don't know how bailout got affected, but I know it affected a lot of people. And some of them are rich, some of them are poor, but from the reports I'm getting. The gentleman from Alabama. Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Garrett. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for two minutes. I thank the chair. I thank the speaker. I come to the floor realizing that there is a problem on Wall Street that will affect Main Street. And I also come here today hopeful, but also realistic. I, um, I will not be supporting this bill today, but I know the bill will pass later on because so much has been added to it to get the votes. But I'm hopeful then that all the promises that have been made by the proponents of this bill will come true after we give $700 billion to Secretary Paulson and whoever follows him in two or three months from now. The promise is that the markets will open up and the markets will go up and credit will be free-flowing soon. But I come here also realistic. Realistic to know that if you don't tackle the underlying problems, we will be right back in this house again on this floor seeking more money and more reform. Realistic also to know if you don't allow for alternatives, you will not get the best bill. And we know that Speaker Pelosi and the White House was not open to listening to any alternatives, and there was alternatives out there. And realistic also in knowing that if you do fail to investigate early enough, these problems will come up as they have. Back in the spring of this year, we and my Republican colleagues asked for investigations on this matter, and we were rebuffed, being told by the chairman, quote, I do not think it's necessary that we have hearings on the soonest possible date. Madam Speaker, I come here and not in support of this bill, but in support of doing something in light of the remarks of economist Robert Schimmer, who says, the U.S. has long been a beacon of free markets. When economic conditions turn sour in other countries, we give very clear instructions on what to do balance the budget, maintain free trade, the rule of law, and do not prop up failing enterprises. He said it, I agree with him. That has always been the U.S. approach, and I believe it is the correct approach. But when the United States ignores its own advice in this situation, we reduce our credibility of this stance. Rewriting the rules of the game at this stage will therefore have serious ramifications, not only for the people of this country, but for the globe and the world as well. You see, Madam Speaker, the social cost of this is far, far greater than the $700 billion that we talk about today. And with that, I yield back. Well, yields back is From this Bill Moyers episode, it just seems that there's disproportionate amount of um, things going on and that it needs to be equalized. So, 
One way is to take a page out of the movie Miracle on 34th Street. Go right ahead. Well, here's a list of toys that we have to push, you know, <laughs> things that we're overstocked on. Now, you'll find that a great many children will be undecided as to what they want for Christmas. When that happens, you immediately suggest one of these items. You understand? I certainly do. <laughs> Good. Now, you memorize that list and I'll... Oh, no, no. I'll tell you, when you've finished, come up to the seventh floor. I'll be waiting for you. Imagine making a child take something it doesn't want just because he bought too many of the wrong toys. That's what I've been fighting against for years, the way they commercialize Christmas. Yeah, there's a lot of bad isms floating around this world, but one of the worst is commercialism. Make a buck, make a buck. Even in Brooklyn, it's the same. Don't care what Christmas stands for. Just make a buck, make a buck. Uh, oh, don't bother. I'll put it away for you. Huh? Oh, thank you, Alfred. Well, what should I do with these? Throw them on a the floor. I get kind of tired just sweeping up dust. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Alfred. The Santa would recommend people went to other um, stores to get products that weren't on sales at Macy's, specifically skates at Schoenfeld's on Lexington Avenue, and then Thelma Ritter from Rear Window, but in this movie, she's confused. She says, Surprise me. Macy's sending people to other stores. Are you kidding me? Well, the only important thing is to make the children happy, and whether Macy or somebody else sells a toy doesn't make any difference. Don't you feel that way? Huh? Oh, me? Oh, yeah, sure. Only I didn't know Macy's did. Well, as long as I'm here, they do. I don't get it. No? I just don't get it. Macy's are sending other customers, other customers to other people's stores. She's like, I don't get it. And, uh, and then the manager overhears this recommendation, and he clearly, he's freaking out. But the, what happens is that the customers end up becoming more loyal to, to Macy's and it's because the service that Macy's is providing can lead to runoff sales because the customers are coming to Macy's to find out A if Macy's has it and B Macy's is recommending where to get it if they can't find it at Macy's so it's almost like the hacker hacking into the security system to show the flaw in the security system and then is given a job to maintain security. This is sort of how things have to go. Uh, it's, it, it's a form of micro employment. I've got a lot of thoughts on this and it, I'm not saying it's going to be solved right away but somehow it's connected with copyright and fossil fuels but that'll be the subject of another episode. I'll try and find a few more things to read in here, and I think we're going to call this a, a podcast. I know there's a train of thought in there somewhere. Okay, so this one's called Zombies of the Old Hardware. While all the attention is directed toward the fantastic transformations of library and information storage services, the main verb in the new process is the recovery of the innumerable of the innumerable vibrating dimensions of the word as such. As technology pushes toward the ultimate elimination of hardware, it asserts the primacy of the word itself. Philosophers, thinkers, and historians as much as executives will continue for some time to live in the shadow of the older hardware. The great law of bibliography, which now applies very obviously to newspapers and magazines, will soon apply to all printed and bound books. The more there were, the fewer there are. The fewer there were, the more there are. The deluxe snob editions of Elb are still plentiful and cheap. A single scrap of Elizabethan handbill is worth a fortune. Another paradox of instant retrieval systems is that while on the one hand they create encyclopedic coverage and access, they also create a much greater need for precise definitions and classifications. If we consider the extent of new medical knowledge made available in the 2500 specialist periodicals in English alone, 
The problem is not one of possession, but of access to what is tantalizingly present but unreachable. Okay, so that's <clears throat> that's still from Take Today, page 105, and I have a piece of toilet paper as the um, marker. The amphetamine marginalia context to give additional tactile description for the purpose of identification, etc. What that made me think of is the Pinterest concept again. YouTube. It's a utility. It's amazing. The statistics before they became even easier to work out when it was only 48 hours every minute. Now it's 60 hours every minute. Or, yeah, it's, it's 60 fucking hours every minute. Roughly, that works out to a decade a day. Clearly, there's an opportunity there to develop microemployment via indexing. In fact, I'm working on a piece of software to try and enable this. And in the same sense that we've had looped and highlight and color and Friendster and MySpace and Facebook and I'm sure other places uh, had other things that we don't know about like in China they had probably names that were Chinese that were also social networks and the first Google one Orkut probably made by a guy named Orkut the point is, is that there's 200,000 podcasts and people love them because of the tactility that presents itself via conversational recollections because everything is text-based now we can get into the whole Finnegan's Wake aspect of uh, or in influence on texting but I, I believe um, my point here is that um, you can reveal an idea and it doesn't uh, necessarily mean that uh, you won't be able to benefit from it in some way or another so my point in what I mentioned well that was my point I'm not going to spoon feed the insights, but uh, you can very well understand that a decade a day, if that were to get indexed and people were driving sales and it, it was like becoming, what the hell? Is that a person? Well, yeah, I guess so. Sounds like a youngster. Okay, well, I'll finish up with the idea that like <laughs> every time you get closer to any kind of truth, there's always an external distraction to see if you can maintain your train of thought. At a decade a day, the fabled eBay power seller, I mean, that person had to go through a lot of formality to get to that distinction. And um, trusted sources, the whole idea of trusted sources and relevance on online, that's the currency. Like Buckminster Fuller said, only integrity is going to count. And... Um, I, the original idea, the name for the idea was called Intagrity. Like it was like little n and then capital T A G and then Ritty, R I T T Y. And the two T's were like thumbtacks. Came up with that one like a couple years ago. And someone told me that they thought it was too, too weird. So I changed it. I'm not going to mention what it is yet, but you know, we got to have some type of thing. But essentially, at a decade a day, if anyone who knew anything about anything in any object in any video, if someone were to create a means of classification, I'm telling you, any revenue that's derived as a result of people creating the classifications and they and they and they get verified as legitimate, this is where you have what I'm talking about. And it's a sustainable development that could very well be useful, could compete with the electronic misdiagnostic investments that have gotten the American economy into such a state. And it would be easy. Anyone could do it who had access. All you'd have to do is sign up, have an email account, and then it's just a matter of it's just a matter of having some incentivization and some fun and uh, I guarantee you I guarantee this would work, not to solve everything, but it would certainly empower some people who, you're not going to make a job out of this, 
but you might get some scratch so that you can at least have some sense of a sense of self. And if you can have that little bit of sense of self, then maybe you can do what Adam Carolla is talking about all the time. Just pull yourself off your own bootstraps and be like, you know, follow the rules, get a job, figure it out. Do it. Do what you got to do. Do what you can live with because that's really all that matters. All right. Well, you've been listening to Painting the Invisible. My name is Richard Altman, and I'll end this off with how I began it. Health and happiness, hope for life, despite all the reasons not to, in fact, because of them. Next time, I'll talk about something else. around the world.